Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Um, thank you for inviting me, Randy. Um, a number of years ago, uh, my intent here is not to tell you how much to charge for a survey. You're all intelligent people, most of you probably have families. You know what you have to do to make a living. But I'm sure we've all been in a situation where we finish looking at a boat, we're driving back home, and you go, you know, I think I forgot to look at something. You always end up going back, don't you? Or you go back the next day because you weren't sure if you did look at it. Um, a long time ago, I was do when I was doing pre-purchase surveys, I, I kind of changed my practice to a different area. But um, I spent about two hours on a boat and I said to the owner, I says, man, this is a piece of crap. You don't want to buy this boat. He goes, God, I'm glad I got you here. He says, but I already spent close to $1,000. He says, what'd you spend $1,000 on? Well, between hauling, power washing, I had the boat detailed, and I had it bottom painted. He says, why did you do that? He says, well, I was so excited about buying the boat. <laughs> I just figured there was nothing wrong with it. The broker told me there was nothing wrong with it. The owner told me there was nothing wrong with it, and you're finding all of this stuff. So I'm driving back to the office. I says, you know, I made about a couple of hundred bucks on the deal. I can't remember what it was. He paid me for my time. And I says, I made a couple of hundred. You already spent almost $1,000. Where do we fit into that food chain for marine surveyors? So I was always told, uh, well, this is, this is, a teacher once asked a student to sum up Socrates' life in four sentences, and here's what he said. The student said, he lived a real long time, he was very intelligent, he gave long speeches, and his friends poisoned him. So believe me, I'm going to stick to an hour, okay? And I was always told to tell a joke. Uh, this I, I, I found in one of my boatyards on Long Island. I was walking past the fence in area the other day, and a large crowd behind the fence was yelling, 13, 13, 13. As curious as I am, I really wanted to find out what was going on, but the fence was too high. I did find a small hole in the fence and decided to look through it. As I looked through the hole, all of a sudden, some idiot poked me in the eye with a stick, and the crowd started yelling, 14, 14, 14. So that's how I learned how to mind my own business. Um, you're going to see some words here. The, the constant word is confidence, confidence, confidence. So, what value do we bring to our marine survey customers? One, that they're making a good decision when they buy the boat. Two, that they are buying, what they are buying will give them the peace of mind because we did the best job that we could. And the confidence that the vessel that they are purchasing will be safe for them and their families. Confidence that they have picked a professional that adheres to the standards and ethics is our profession. The confidence that their investment in our services was well worth the time and money they spent to have us do what we do best. And that their investment is worth what they're paying for. We do a lot. Sometimes we don't think about what we do, but we really do a lot. And a liability factor, folks, is getting more and more. Um, I think the maritime attorneys lately within the last five or six years of seeing us as an untapped source of revenue for them. Um, what value do we bring to the insurance industry? Oops. Okay. The confidence that they, an insurance adjuster or an underwriter, has picked a surveyor that will adhere to all the standards and regulations that will affect their decision to insure the vessel. The confidence that we will examine a vessel, a loss for a vessel, present the facts, write a professional report, and help them make the decisions, a right coverage decision, and we are unbiased. Uh, when I do claims work, I tell the owner of the boat, who right away thinks we're there to deny the claim, when in fact, I tell them, look, I don't care if your insurance company pays or not. I'm here for your boat. I'm not here for you, Mr. Customer. I'm not here for the insurance company. I want to find out what happened to her and how she can be repaired, 
excuse me, we still refer to them as ours, and the right method of repair. If the insurance company has to pay for that, then so be it. So that un, unbiased and unprejudiced. What value do we do bring to the marine industry and our own peers? A favorable reputation in the industry, that's very important. A professional membership of the society such as SAMS, IMS, NAMS, follows and adheres to the ethics of their society, honesty, education, maintaining professional CEs, that's why I'm here, right? An expectation to do a professional job. That's what we bring to our peers, to our societies, and to the legal profession. What value do we bring to law enforcement? If you do claims work and you're working on thefts or something like that, sometimes you assist in a recovery of the vessel. How many of you do fire investigations? I, I like them. I do something different. But during a fire investigation, for, you work uh, with the fire investigator, the insurance company, and many fire investigators are not surveyors. They have no idea what's on the boat. They don't know about wiring, about fuel. This is how you assist them. You assist law enforcement during accident investigations because most law enforcement individuals don't really understand. And how many of you have done a fatality claim where the law enforcement has actually literally taken the whole boat apart before you even get there? There's no preservation of evidence. And you're, you're there for the insurance company to try and figure out what happened. You had a question? Sure. I'm working on one right now in the Bronx. You allow the investigator to know right off the bat that, hey, you know, this is this of course. Program. But you know what? They don't care. There was no loss of life. If there was no loss of life, they don't care. It's a boat. It's the way you look at it. It might be worth hundred fifty thousand dollars. This boat that I'm working on now is two hundred fifty thousand. It's a product. I mentioned to the fire, New York City Fire Marshal. This is what we think happened to you, but we have to prove it. He goes, okay. This is why I just thought I'd let you know. He goes, thank you. <laughs> but see, they're there to do their job. They get their paycheck. They're very good at what they do, but if it's not a catastrophe and it's not a loss of life, they get the paperwork done, they hand it in, and they move on to the next job. Any law enforcement officer will tell you that too. I just completed the ABYC NASBLA Marine Accident Investigators course, which has never been offered to individuals before, uh, non-law enforcement, and the instructor there said that. This is the pressure that they're under. Go there, find out what happened, get the report. If there's a fatality, hopefully you can explain it to the family on what happened, move on to the next one. What value do we bring to the non-maritime legal system? Um, I'm talking about non-maritime attorneys. We assist uh, in estate and divorce valuations. We assist attorneys in legal issues, such as rules of the road. We assist attorneys during the claims process. Many attorneys that are hired by insurance companies aren't maritime. We appear in court as an expert witness. We appear in court as an expert appraiser. Um, new IRS guidelines, by the way, folks. Um, the IRS is now saying that any uh, qualified donation must be performed by a, a professional appraiser, a qualified appraiser. Fortunately, being a member of IIMS, NAMS and SAMS qualifies you for that. But if you mess up and you do not justify your values on your report, you could be subjected to a $10,000 fine. So the IRS is now finding an additional source of income in the public. 
I met a woman um, several months ago at a, 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 um, a report writing a seminar. She just retired from the IRS after 36 years. Her job was to audit tax returns on people that have donated more than $1 million in fine art. I says, how many people donate a million bucks in art and statues? And she says, you'd be surprised. But by the time it gets from the donation process to her desk, it could be as long as three years. So that's where that old three-year rule came up. That there's no three-year rule on that stuff anymore. Okay, so why do we charge what we do? Let's look at a typical 30-foot powerboat, twin engines for pre-purchase. Mentally make a note on what you would charge to inspect that boat. How long it would take you to travel to the boat, inspect it, return to the office computer time, emailing and or faxing. A buyer is possibly, yes, Karen. You said something earlier about you and then you just, can you get back to the other slide? And then you had that slide. And I think we've all been there where you get to the boat, you arrive, you're ready to um, do what you have to do. You've done your homework, you've arrived with material, you have the correct tools, you have the education to do it, it takes a job. You're all set and ready to go. You get there and all of a sudden there's Hate to use the term, but there's something that in the mind of the purchaser or the person you're representing that ends your day. It might be an hour in, it might be two hours in. And I guess my concern is that a lot of my peers are paid for their time. And your time's not even the homework, bringing the tools, the, the scheduling. Your time's what you brought to the table educationally. And you're, you know, the, the fact that you have those letters out to your name. I'll, I'll I would, hopefully answer your question as we can, as well, we can I, press I just, on. I would argue that your fee, when, when you're talking about this, you're mentally, um, you're mentally putting a value on it. And I think you can, regardless of the time you spend, your fee should be the same. So the, what, I, what I, I'm hearing from you is if you spend an hour or 10 hours and your fee was 450 or $500, if you spend one hour there, you should charge the same thing. Yes. Because Good for you. To, you're Good. prepared you scheduled it, you've come to the table with everything. You fulfilled your end of the contract, whether you've been told that you should, even if the guy wants to walk away. Walk away That's right. That's right. And if you bring that up to the buyer before you even get out of your truck in your work order, I, I do that. I say that's that that's the, hours. that's a good that's a good that's idea. That's a good idea. Now, when I mentioned about myself, I spent I got paid for my time when I was there. That was like twenty five years ago. We didn't even have contracts. We didn't have work orders. But with the advent of the legal system being, there's probably more unemployed attorneys out there today than ever before, so they're all looking for work, you know? <clears throat> but that's a very good point. So uh, let's think about what the buyer is probably going to pay for before they buy the boat. Now, some of these prices here come from the New York area. It might be a little certainly different than North Carolina and or Florida. Remove some shrink wrap and dispose of it, hauling eight to $10 a foot. Some yards charge a minimum of $150 for a short haul. Power wash the bottom $5 a foot. So over 30 foot, it could be 150 bucks, right? Maybe the bottom paint prior to the launch, okay? Maybe the buyer will pay for an engine survey. If you do this, do you charge extra? Twin gas engine inspection, 400 bucks. Tune up, 400. Oil change, 150 on twin engine boats, right? Twin diesel inspections, 1200 bucks. That's pretty cheap in the New York area, by the way. I think Caterpillar in New York is right now about $375 an hour. Go to book. $375 an hour. And people don't think twice about paying for it if they got a 55-foot boat with a pair of C-12s in it. 
Uh, paint out drive, 65 bucks each. You've got twin out drives, $130. Test run the boat, one hour, $125 an hour. What's the labor rate down here, by the way, in Maryland? At 125, Randy? Okay, yeah. When I first started, it was like $62.50. You know? Take a look at the docking fees that the buyer will spend after they buy the boat. So think about, and most of you here probably own a boat, $100 a foot for summer dockage. Some yards are charging as high as $150 a foot in prime locations. It could be four or $5,000, four to $4,500. Winter storage. Maintenance, just general maintenance on a boat if they don't do it themselves. What about insurance? Average cost for a 30-foot power boat for a good policy, 800,000 bucks maybe, right? Where do we fit into this food chain? Add up the total so far. <clears throat> Short haul, power wash, bottom paint, engine check, dockage, winter storage, insurance, plus eight grand. Where do we fit in? How much will the buyer pay for a typical five-year-old 30-foot cruiser? 30-foot Sea Ray, it just came right off uh, the Bucknet. They're buying a 2015, roughly $155,000. What are you charging for that 30-footer? Right? A boat that's seven years old already, eight years old, $100,000. Where do we fit in? Brokerage commission, five to 10%. Not bad, right? At 5% on a 2014 boat, 6,800 bucks. That's negotiable, some of them pay, will pay only 3%. I met a young man in Lauderdale a few years ago who decided not to go to college. He had a chance to go to the Naval Academy. I mean, that was free. his father was devastated. But he was 21 years old, he sold his first mega yacht. I mean, he just started as a broker, 13 million. This kid is ecstatic. He had a nice commission on the deal. And I said to him, I said, you better save some of your money because you might not sell another boat all year long. And Uncle Sam's gonna want at least 50% of that. He didn't listen to me, he didn't listen to his father and he's no longer brokering because <laughs> he didn't have the money to pay the IRS. He spent it all, new car, new condo, you know? But the brokers do pretty well when you think about it. A good broker can do very, very well. And I, I have, I've seen some brokers doing six figures on a sale on a boat and they deserve it. I mean, they keep the boat clean. They got a bottle of champagne there. They put flowers there for the women on the boat. It's great. Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think most brokers are very honest. The ones that uh, belong to the professional societies maintain their credits, their CEs. They have CEs too. So where do we fit into the food chain? Let's suppose the following. You travel to and from the boat. Let's say it's an hour. For me, it's usually when I was doing survey, it was usually longer than that. Time to do the sea, uh, survey in a sea trial, it's like roughly seven hours. Computer time, average 10 hours to a 30 foot boat. Could be a little less, could be a little bit more. Some people will spend more than two hours on computer time reviewing a report. So let's see where we are. If you charge $10 a foot to do a survey, and I'm not saying anybody in this room does that, you're making 30 bucks an hour. <laughs> probably become the greeter at Home Depot. And here's the reason why I'm bringing this up. If you charge $30 a foot, you're at $90 an hour. The mechanics labor rates a buck and a quarter. Why are you less important? And I'm not insulting anybody here, but why are we less important than a mechanic? No, he's not, but that's what they charge. Well, the, you're right, but somebody is making, somebody is charging $125 an hour. 
the yard has has liability insurance. They got workers' comp. We have E&O if you have it. We got professional dues. We have to maintain CEs. All that stuff is up. We have wear and tear on our truck or our car. On your body. Yeah, yeah. And we, we're, we put ourselves in a really high liability situation. God forbid if something goes wrong with that boat and somebody dies. Huh? That's the so think about this. If you charge by the hour instead, now this is a very difficult thing to wrap yourself around because I think we're the only profession in the industry charges by the foot, except the bottom painter, the shrink wrapper, right? There was a young man doing a survey on Long Island. I was talking to him and he said he was thinking about joining Sam's and we were talking and I says, can I be, ask you a very personal question? He says, sure. I says, what are you charging to do this boat? It was a 40 footer. He says, $500. So I tell you what, this is not an insult. Why don't you go get yourself a couple of gallons of bottom paint, some rollers and a roller pan. You'd make more money and you wouldn't have to worry about getting sued. He looked at me, he goes, you know, you're right. The guy spent more than that having a bottom painted on this 40 footer. So if you were charging, say, $80 an hour, at 10 hours, it's 800 bucks to do a 30-footer. Still not enough. Um, Andrew, right, says you were charging thirty to $40,000 to do that 100-meter or 50-meter. I don't think that's enough. <laughs> You know, think, think about 30 to 40 grand, and you've got all these subcontractors that have to get paid too. Yeah, yeah. Charging by the hour. Makes your service more consistent with the industry's time and materials. People are more familiar with paying by the hour and by the foot of other things in their lives. Why not for us? You go to the auto dealership, it's their labor rate, it's right there, right? Granted, they have overhead, but we got overhead too. And one of our biggest things we have to worry about, and this is not to scare you, is getting sued. I remember probably 30 years ago, I did a 30-foot O-Day in February. It was freezing cold. The guy that was buying a boat was an accountant, and he was on my back all the time, wanting to know what this is, wanting to know what that is. So I gave him a pad and a pen, and I says, go make your own list. Help me do the survey. Get out of my hair. So at the end of the survey, I says, look, everything looks okay. I says, but your whole water system and everything's been winterized. We don't know if there's any leaks in it or anything. In the spring, hold some money, uh, hold some money in escrow before you go to closing say $2,000, just in case there's something wrong with the water system. He goes, got it. He called me up in May. He says, I got a problem with the boat. Go, oh, God. So what's the matter? He said, my water heater's leaking. I said, well, did you hold that money in escrow? No. Why not? He says, I didn't think it was necessary. I says, well, I told you to. He said, did you put it in writing? So right after that, I added to my report. All fuel, water, holding tanks must be filled 72 hours prior to closing and checked for leaks. That's how you learn by making mistakes, right? So the American Society appraises, here's what a furniture appraiser charges. Now, I've been at ASA for 22 years, okay? A jewelry appraiser. A heavy equipment appraiser, 150 to 300 hours. These are all self-employed people. These aren't people that work for companies, okay? A machinery appraiser, 150 to 300 an hour. General labor, $70 an hour. Skilled labor, 90. Mechanical, 125. Marine surveyors. 
The nice thing about charging by the hour, the boat is not out of the water and you have to wait till the travel lift guy has his coffee. The batteries are dead. The engines won't start. The boat is loaded with the owner's junk and you have to empty all the lockers just to look inside. The power washer won't start. The broker, the owner, the buyer are standing over your shoulder all day. How much longer are you going to take? The owner says, this has been like that for years. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good one. The buyer keeps asking, what is this for? Why are you, when you're at the other end of the boat? You've all had that, right? The buyer is way up in the V-berth, you're in the engine room, and he says, hey, Ken, can you, can you look at this? What is this? We all have a routine when we go on a boat, don't we? And if it interferes with your routine, you get kind of confused and you get a little messed up. When you charge by the hour, you'll find that these problems generally go away, okay? I don't wanna keep you too long, so I won't ask you too many questions. I'm paying for your time. By the time the buyer sees that you're a real professional, he or she will say, take your time. I don't want you to miss anything. I'm paying a lot of money for this boat. Changing your thought process is not easy to do this. It can be a little difficult at first, but try adding up what you charge per foot, break it down in per hour, and adjust it according to what you want per hour. You'll find that after a few times it comes easy. So what I mean by this is if you charge, say, $30 a foot to do a 30-foot boat, that's $900, okay? If you looked at it per hour, you made, and you, it took you 15 hours, to do it, you're making what, 70 to 74 bucks an hour. If you feel comfortable with that, that's fine. But if you see that your formula is, you're only making $40 an hour or $30 an hour, increase your rates a little bit, depending on the competition. That's the biggest issue we have, is the competition in the area. There's always somebody out there that will do it for less. But when you start compromising on your rates and your profession and what you do, you'll find that you make mistakes because you're, you're, you're there and you want to get it done, but you didn't charge enough to do the job in the first place. Believe me, it's happened to me. It's happened to probably a lot of people in, in the room here. You had uh, I had a dollar a foot, the way I'm doing it now, if the boat's 10 years old, I had $2 a foot, if it's 20 years old, just because we're running right now. That's, that's, that's a good concept. The older the boat, the more expensive it is, because you know yeah. you're going to find problems, you know? It's just, it's just a different way. If you, if you look at what you're charging per foot, divided by what you think the average time is that you spend on a job, and if you see your labor rate per hour, you really want to make more money, don't we? I mean, that's what it's all about, folks. We want to make more money. We want to retire when we're 75, 80. <laughs> A lot of us are, are in this career because we love it. And we put our love for the, for the profession and the career sometimes ahead of our own responsibilities to ourselves and our families because we love it so much. Yes. Well, you know, that's interesting you say that. Uh, I was at an ABYC meeting uh, last week in Seattle and somebody said that uh, they asked me what the difference was between SAMs and NAMs and I'm a dual member. And I, I, I says, well, I, I really think NAMs is more of a, um, a high professional, um, sh high big ship stuff, cargo, and roll on, roll off stuff and stuff like that. I said, Sam's is more yachts and small craft. So he said to me, he says, I heard that Sam's is full of a bunch of hobbyists. I says, really? I says, well, I tell you what, if they are a bunch of hobbyists, they, they really do a hell of a good job, number one. 
But I don't know anybody that's in this business because it's a hobby. They have families to support. We got insurance, we got membership dues. I said, this is, it's a profession. It's a practice. And I think for years, marine surveying has always been, has always had that stigma, you know? And it's, it's people like us that are here maintaining our CE credits. And you know the average age of a SAM surveyor is 55? And I, I see a lot of us are just staying here and just want to continue working. Not because we have to, because we love the profession so much. So never regard your study as a duty, but an enviable opportunity to learn. I have know uh, um, there was a marine surveyor in um, Long Island who recently passed away who was in his 90s. He went to the seminars. He wasn't working anymore. He just wanted to keep this going. If you think you're too small to make a difference, then you've never been in bed with a mosquito. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sorry? <laughs> no, a mosquito. <laughs> Yeah, there's guys in Florida, they, I think they're stretching up there more than I think they're stretching up in here. They charge by the day. Whether it's a 30 foot load or a 50 foot load, it's 1500 bucks a day. Yeah. A lot of guys have been doing that for years. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, in a way, I guess they've broken it down where they have a daily rate. If it's $1,500 uh, 1500 for the day, and they know they're going to spend 12 to 15 hours between a full day on the boat, computer time, merging photos, and everything else like that. You know, that's, that's, that's another way of looking at it, you know? Hey, you got most of the East Coast, Florida, Miami, and West Coast, they're still going back and forth. Yeah. yeah. I know who started this idea of going back and forth. Well, that's the way it's always been since I've been in the business, and that's been over 35 years. It's always been by the foot. You know, I don't know why. My first survey was done in 1976 with, on a 23-foot Jersey skiff, wood, while it was in the water. And while the guy noticed I had uh, um, a um, aqualung in the back of my truck, he says, is that tank full? I said, sure, I always keep it full. He goes, would you change my prop for me? Sure. I strapped on the tank, I changed this prop, I went home to my wife and she goes, how'd it go? I said, he gave me 150 bucks cash, look at this. This was 1976, she goes, that's all you made? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, I, I, I really opened up my eyes probably about 25 years ago to this hourly thing. And I was just keeping my rates consistent with the others in the area. Then some, uh, Old timer said to me, I asked him what he charged and I was shocked. I says, uh, how do you explain to people what you charge? He says, the first thing I do is I tell them how valuable I am to them. I don't tell them right off the bat what I do charge. I tell them what am I going to do for them? The insurance companies, the lending institutions, they all accept me. He says, you have to sell yourself first before you tell them what it's gonna cost. He says, the last time you bought a new truck, didn't the salesperson give you the walk around? That's what they call it in the sales and in the automobile industry. You walk around, kick the tires, look at the grill, pop the hood, and then you go to find out what it's going to cost you. Yes? I think a lot. I think a lot of us do that. We, 
after after a number of years in the business, you have a sense of, you know, and most, in my opinion, most boat owners that are buying boats think they know more than you do. The broker knows more than you do. And the owner of the boat knows more than you do. You walk onto a boat, you find a, a real serious electrical issue. And the boat owner says, it's been like that for years. There's nothing wrong with that. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. They, yes. So did everybody hear that? Hear his comments? That's a very good point. Um, I didn't know that they were doing that in Florida, but that's that's not bad at all. Charging, having a daily rate, and like he said, you're, you're going to get rid of all the tire kickers, and you're going to get the the client that doesn't mind spending that extra money. Yes, sir. And uh, you're charging daily rate based on the size of days. Well, I think I think I think what you can do is you can set it up um, in categories. You know, less than 25 25 feet, I charge this much per day. 25 to 35, this much per day. 35 to 40. Uh, and whenever I did anything over 50 foot, it was by the hour. I never ever charged a daily rate or or per foot. Because you get on a 53 Hatteras and you go, God, how long am I going to be here? You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. And some of those jobs take three or four days. I mean, you know. Sure. And, and charging by the age of a boat, good idea, too. You know, you get a 30 year old Hatteras you know, that, you know, you're going to find things wrong with it, no matter how good it, it, it was 30 years ago. <clears throat> Fred? Yeah. 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 And you know what? I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, you, you people, but I'm looking at the, the gray hair and, and, and this beautiful woman sitting here who's got a great reputation. You know, when uh, this, I should really be talking to Surveyor Associates because the ones that are coming into the industry, hopefully we're getting younger ones, but I recently met a young man who graduated from uh, Iris up in Rhode Island and he started in a survey, he's charging hundred dollars a foot because of all of his education, his student loans and everything else like that, he has to. Now he says, if I didn't have that education, I could probably charge less, but I'm going to be learning as I'm doing it and putting people's liability in very awkward situations. You know, um, for those of us that do a lot of marine claims work, you uh, and there's a major loss, the first thing I ask the underwriters is, I'd like to see the survey. And I can guarantee you, I'd like to see the survey before the attorneys do. Because that's the first thing the attorneys ask for. 
So uh, most of you know SAMS has E&O insurance. Um, if you haven't taken advantage of it, I would suggest you do. It's, it's a great program for the money. For almost 30 years I had it, it was costing me over $3,000 a year Although I, for you know, insurance. I'm sorry? Never. Never. <laughs> never, never, ever. And I, I, I can say that I, the only complaint I ever had was that guy with the water heater, you know? Um, I know I've done surveys when I was doing them and I didn't make, I mean, I made money, but I could have made more, you know? And when I speak with other professionals and what they were charging, I've seen, this, this is why I came up with this years ago. This is an old, old presentation. I just upgraded it a little bit. But um, sometimes I think we just try and focus in on what is our competition. And one old timer said, um, when somebody calls him up and he says, what are you charging? If that's, if that's their first question, I know they just price shopping. So he says, if somebody, if I tell somebody it's, Let's say it's fifteen. If he's going to charge by the day fifteen hundred dollars, but why do you charge so much? I can get the guy down the street that's going to do it for eight hundred dollars. Well, yeah, you can do that, but I fix his surveys. That's what he and he and I've used that phrase quite a few times. And the guy says, "Okay, you came highly recommended." I says, "Why didn't you say that in the first place?" He said, "I just want to see what you're going to charge." You know. Are there any other questions? I don't want to interfere with your lunch. No? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.